Controlling the world, indeed, <laughs> controlling little things like midges. Controlling the world is a forlorn and catastrophic ambition, whether for the ego of imperial dictators or for a single domineering, dominating species. This is precisely what the psalmist prays to be delivered from. Total control is the ambition blasphemously to outdo God, even for a species with a God-given mandate of care for creation. This is the corrosive effect of human empires, which have led us to confuse a mighty God with the exclusiveness of a tin pot tyrant. Remember, it's the rotten servant, Jesus says, who does only what they're told. The presumption of entitlement and watertight control, with no gleanings for the poor nor crumbs for the, the dogs under the table, sowing seed yet excluding the birds and, and poisoning the bees. In Jesus' words, this happens at the cost of soul, of life, of the essence of what we are. And what we are is woven into the life of the planet. Forget butterfly effect. Because of our numbers and the scale of our transformative intervention, the human effect is one that no other life can ignore. God's language, though, which creation speaks is one which resists control. A dialogue rather than a monologue. Weeds grow through the tarmac. Microorganisms dismantle. Moth and rust express God's vengeance. Can Christians hear in Scripture how a mighty God spoke forth creation and in doing so displayed that matchless love, grace, confidence and power? in renouncing absolute sovereignty. How Christ, like father, like son, emptied himself to share with creatures bound by natural laws, yet able to make decisions. The landscape around me is beautiful where we have entered into negotiation with creation, rather than where we have conquered or exterminated. But that is where the soul is lost. Why would you want to wash away a valley Evict the people who live there to say nothing, and maybe that's the problem of all the wildlife who are denied even the strangled voice that people have. What of the life downstream? What of life-giving rivers which are made into stony beds? Why? Perhaps to run a hospital, to keep our old folk warm in winter, to provide light for our children to see for their lessons. In Scotland in the 50s, the great hydro schemes of the glens connected rural communities who, who were too far off the grid to be served by the coal-burning stations which were the norm at the time. That's why. Or why would you want to build a tower or lots of towers, hundreds of feet tall, with turning blades that you can see for miles? There you can graze livestock beneath them, uh, whilst allowing for cycling and walking and other healthy human pursuits. Why? Perhaps to charge a car, write a book, keep lights on in empty offices, loud music in restaurants. Good things and bad, and probably something in between. On the other hand, when these things exist, why today would you want to burn coal and oil, releasing the greenhouse gases stored by nature in the earth over millions of years? swamping the ability of our partners, the plants and the trees to sustain that balance of creation, tipping out of balance God's garden which has suffered the ambitions of our species over the last 10,000 years. That came with benefits, but also it came with filthy air, injustice, the shattering of the climate and more, more that common sense dictated we should disregard. Coal mines have gone from Scotland. Hydro, on this relatively moderate scale by global standards, and for now also wind farms, have come. They're not perfect, but far, far less a crucifixion of our future. And despite NIMBY protests and the Trumpian misinformation that's still around, people do love to come and wonder at these awesome sites. But for those who simply protest, have we forgotten 
the deep respect, awareness and love we might otherwise reserve both for the flaws and the blessings of our closest dependents and relatives, indeed our breadwinning relatives. Especially if you've given up noticing the urgent cost to humans and all other life of what you are doing already, what your starting point is. So that like the cross to Peter, the cost of new directions, new paths, new lifestyles seems only to be cost, only threat, because we're naively enslaved by the threats of the fossil fuel era. Our terribly urgent, dangerous starting point looks neutral because we're so used to breathing in air that curtails thousands of lives every year in the UK alone. The judgments which face us, one and together, are not between good and bad or the lesser of two evils, but between different packages of both costs and benefits. Like the promise of jobs from the new oil field or coal mine, the threat to the economy if oil uh, and nuclear subs were, were banished from Scotland. We need more allowance for wisdom than just a scorecard will give you, as well as lovingly resisting those satanic common sense exceptions. The Celtic spirituality, which was recycled in the 20th century, loves to highlight how rural Scottish life was once immersed in prayerful negotiation with creation. Pope Francis suggests the repurposing of grace before meals as a powerful environmental action because it reconnects our heads, our hearts, our bodies. Should we no longer turn on a light or a computer except with mindful gratitude? Can you pray with plastic? Or do we not have time for that? Are we too immersed in common nonsense for that? Like Peter, ready to talk Jesus out of the awful cost of pursuing what Jesus feels is his divine calling. Crucifixion. Let's not go there, says Peter. But since Peter is reconciled to the brutal imperialism which we still idolise in our own culture, because of that, the real and present danger of the cross completely blots out the hope of transformation and resurrection. But would we have time for such ideas? Do we have time even for our uh, obsessional stop gaps of finding superficially green and slightly less polluting ways to do the same old thing? Do I need to answer when the voice of the earth, words or no words, is loud and clear? And technology prevents our escape from the cries of forests, folk and fauna just because they might happen to be the far side of the world or the far side of that hill. On the top of this Scottish mountain, getting on for a thousand metres up, I can hear of the struggles of friends in the Pacific with cyclones and water inundation, other friends all around the world as well as in the north. Science ensures abundant early warning of tipping point. And the news media, though they are dismissive of disaster outside the global north, they do contrive to hint without comfort of the wounds which are inflicted on the planet by this species that we like to call the world. Though maybe we do appreciate our power, our food, our transport, even our medicine, and so much of that originates in plants by the ingenious and energetic strategies of deception and evasion that we employ to keep things out of sight, out of mind. So enjoy your bacon roll, but don't pretend it happens without the slaughterhouse, the cries of the ewes for their stolen lambs, and the long hot transport in those lorries. Enjoy, as I do, dairy products, and though globally ruminant animals condition and really improve the soil, the sheer scale of meat and dairy for human consumption is a greater source of methane even than the fossil fuel industry. And methane, well, that's hugely more potent in global heating than CO2, but if you stop putting it out, it dissipates far more rapidly. There is no life without impact, no footfall without footprint. Let's take that today as good news, which means that the considerations of scale and differences of degree are far more important than the satanically misleading absolutes like, do I pollute or don't I? 
Because though I cannot be completely green, I can live with my flaws and do something about it rather than further damage and disregard the voices of God's planet. You can see this in the nonsensical way we've sometimes chosen to translate Psalm 19, in which the poet reflects on the constant communion of creation. They have no words or language. Uh, the poet is reflecting on our determination to unhear those many voices and to depersonalise those many characters of, of nature, which God openly invites to join, in, indeed to give substance to, any praise or worship we might offer. Trees do talk to trees. Flowers, flowers listen for the hum of bees, who are themselves constantly communicating the location and the nature of pollen and nectar. These disregarded words and voices of creation are vital to our life, well-being, our survival. It's the hope of COP that nations have the chance to come face to face together, to look eye to arm's length eye, to wriggle free from the yoke of greed and complacency and control. Interaction is the God-given essence of life. That's why Christian devotion revolves around the sharing of food and drink taken from the earth, transformed by microscopic life, and then reshaped by human hand. The very shape of these mountains speaks of the volcanoes that birthed them, the ice that carved them, the trees that once covered them, and humans that cut them down thousands of years ago, perhaps. Dear God, give us wisdom as we negotiate with rather than eradicate the life on which we depend. Speak to the earth, and speaking God's language, creation will teach you. Amen. Amen.